right, this message is originally supposed to be in line with the uh, old Baptist hobby horses. I've been preaching on this series. I wanted to address the topic of a kind of a uh, reoccurring thing right now. Uh, many, many of you guys know what I'm talking about, but uh, is the idea of homosexuality. And it makes sense because Baptist preachers historically always preached against homosexuality. But the thing was, they didn't preach on, about it enough because it really wasn't a deal. It wasn't that big of a deal way back in the early days of the independent Baptist movement. It just didn't hardly exist. Nobody even thought about that. And those who did, it was kind of like in the closet. Nobody really uh, dealt with the issue. And I just recently listened to, uh, in the last few weeks, listened to an old sermon, classic sermon from Lester Roloff that was called uh, The End Time Sin of Homosexuality. And it kind of surprised me when I realized what year he was preaching that. And it had to have been the late 70s or very early 80s because he died in the 80s. And he was talking like, uh, hey, this sin is going to permeate uh, Hollywood. Everybody's going to be talking about it and accepting it and didn't even realize, you know, like, like it's just going to sneak up on everybody. And uh, this was the way he was preaching kind of he in a time where nobody else was really preaching about it hardly because they didn't think it was a big deal. And he was saying, you don't realize how it's creeping in. And, and as you know, after that whole sexual revol uh, uh, re revolution in the seventies, the next big thing was just like all manners of perverse wickedness, you know, and I, the next big thing was uh, a whole lot of people were turning into uh, transvestites and, and homosexuals and LGBT thing started to creep it up. Uh, and so, Anyway, so I wanted to go ahead and preach on that, but let's be honest, if I preach on homosexuality right now against the sin of homosexuality, my first thinking is that's probably not going to affect anybody in this uh, room, <laughs> you know, who's dealing with this sin that I need to chart against. And so it's turned, it took a little bit of a different turn. Okay, and in fact, I'm preaching on this, the title of the message or the, the, the word or topic that I'm talking about is homophobia, homophobia, okay? And this is something, aren't you used to? You're homophobic. And people, ironically, this fear of being called a homophobic, right? And so uh, uh, this is something that has been, uh, all around. This is kind of like the, uh, the 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 way I want to talk about the sermon today is from that lens of what the word homophobia is, and you'll have to be patient with me as I get to the main points of the sermon. But first, by introduction, let's talk about what a phobia is. Okay, word that's thrown out there as though anybody who is against uh, LGBT whatever is a homophobe, it really doesn't even make sense. It really doesn't even fit the definition of what a phobia is. So let me explain what's a phobia. If you looked up, uh, well, I'll get that in a minute. If Just a basic definition of what a phobia is. An exaggerated, usually inexplicable or illogical fear of a particular object, class of objects, or uh, situation. Okay, and if you study out the idea of phobia, I believe everybody has little bits of phobia in them, right? Claustrophobia, anybody struggle with that one? I do. I don't like to be like trapped in a space where I might not be able to get out or, or confined. Just the thought of that will make me a little worried, you know, maybe somewhat illogically because there's really no reason to worry, but your mind just starts playing tricks on you and gets the best out of it. But basically, there's three different types of phobia, uh, probably maybe more, I don't know, but these are the basic classifications of phobia, okay? One is called a specific phobia. Uh, specific phobia, meaning that you have a fear of specific objects, a certain object. Uh, probably one of the most common ones, a fear of spiders is called what? Arachnophobia. Everybody's heard that, that word, right? You have a fear of spiders. Now, there are some good reasons to fear spiders in certain situations, but there are those who have an irrational, illogical reason for just like, ah, freaking out because there's, there's spiders there. Uh, but you think about that, snakes, some people are afraid of that. Uh, uh, there's even one I saw that was a fear of bridges. Maybe I would think that would be more like a, a afraid of heights or something like that. But some people just have this fear of bridges, don't want to cross a bridge, don't want to see a, a bridge. It gives them like an irrational uh, fear. Okay, so there's specific phobia, and then there's what's called social 
uh, social, social <laughs> phobia, social phobia. Okay, and the idea is that you're, it's usually a fear of like being embarrassed in front of a crowd or afraid to perform in front of a crowd or whatever because you just have this illogical fear, you know, that you're going to be embarrassed or uh, made fun of or humiliated or something like that. Those are usually social phobias. And then there is agoraphobia. Uh, which is the fear of being trapped in a situation where you can't get out of. So the claustrophobia, that's the one that people typically think of. Uh, and there's other things like that, getting into a situation you can't get out of. And some people, they just have this fear of that. Maybe even, I don't know if this, if this would be social or it'd be even like getting into a conversation or into a relationship or something like that, not being able to get out of it. Uh, this is something that people struggle with. And I think all of us have little bits of phobias of different things, you know, the heights or afraid of, and they, it doesn't mean you not wrong to be afraid of these uh, certain things. It's natural. It's normal for us to have fears. Okay. Uh, and the Bible uh, talks about fear a lot. Sometimes you're like, hey, the Bible says not to fear. Other times you're like, hey, the Bible says fear. Well, the Bible makes it very specific that we're supposed to fear the Lord, right? That's not an irrational or illogical fear. That's a fear based on some very good reasons for having that fear, okay? But we're supposed to fear God. In Matthew 10, 28, Jesus said, And fear not them which uh, kill the body, but are not able to kill the soul, but rather fear him which is able to destroy both soul and body in hell. And so our fear should be towards the Lord. Uh, you know, he's the one uh, that we're going to, that, who has control over everything, and we're going to live with him for eternity. And so he has, he's all powerful, and he's the only one that we should fear. But the world likes to talk about this, uh, this kind of buzzword is homophobia. And if you look up homophobia in the dictionary, it doesn't really match what a phobia is because it'll say something like this. An aversion, an aversion or hostility to or disdain for gay people. If you have an aversion to them or hostility towards them or disdain them, then you are homophobic. Okay? It's what the, is what that definition is, which really doesn't line up with what a phobia is. If I hate spiders, who, who would say I hate spiders? or I hate snakes, or something like that. And the reason I hate them is because they're creepy, right? Uh, they're nasty. They're poisonous. You know, I don't know which ones are poison, which ones aren't poison, but I don't want to uh, get in a situation where a spider's going to jump out and bite me or something. Look, that's not an irrational, illogical fear. That's a legitimate fear. That's not arachnophobia. That just means I don't like spiders, Okay, and so the same is true for all these different things. So the real word, when they say you're a homophobe, what they mean is anti-homo. You're anti. You're against homosexuality, as the world. That's the phrase that the world uses. Okay, we use the word uh, sodomite usually because that's what the Bible lumps them together. I'll get to that here later on. But uh, a better uh, word than homophobia is anti-homo. And let me say that I'm not just seeking amens here, but this is just true. If you are pro-Bible, you're anti-homo. If you're pro-Bible, you're against a lot of things. You're anti a lot of things because you're pro-Bible. And so this is the case. Uh, we should fear the Lord more than we should fear than we fear men. Amen. And that's not a phobia. That's just a, a rational uh, and logical thing to do. Okay, Proverbs 8 in our text here, in fact, I'm not going to have the opportunity to go through the chapter. It's, not, it's definitely not an expository type message. But in this chapter, what you have is wisdom is kind of personified. And of course, we're talking about not just being smart or intelligent, but godly wisdom. Uh, wisdom that God, you know, of going after God, seeking His, seeking the Bible. And basically what you see from this text here is that there are those who fear God and, uh, and they love godliness, they love godly wisdom, or they hate godly wisdom and, uh, and therefore, you know, they just love wickedness. They love evil things because they reject God's, God's word and godly wisdom, okay? Pro, uh, Proverbs 8, verse 13 says, The fear of the Lord is, if you fear God, here's what, here's, 
the result of it. The fear of the Lord is to hate evil, pride, in arrogancy, in the evil way, in the forward mouth, do I hate, David said. Okay? And that's because he feared the Lord. You fear the Lord, you're going to hate evil. Now, I have many times preached about against arrogance, arrogancy, being arrogant. I've preached against pride. I've even preached against a forward mouth, okay? And so I'm not cherry picking as some would say, like, oh, man, all you ever want to do is talk about and bash homos, right? That's not the case. What's true is I believe in the Bible. I love the Bible. I, I'm preaching what the Bible says, which is against a lot of things, including pride and all those kinds of things that I've mentioned. But you cannot tell me if you believe in the Bible that homosexuality isn't part of what is called the evil way. It's an evil way. It definitely goes against God, and God has a lot to say about, about it. <coughs> Honestly, the reason I don't preach, I mean, it comes up sometimes because of the certain situations or whatever, but the reason I don't preach about homosexuality, and I don't want to go just all the time to the scriptures that talk about the uh, certain things that the Bible says, some that I'll share here in this message, the reason I don't like going to I don't like talking about it. I like to just pretend it's not even out there. It's not even a thing, right? In my mind, I'm like, hey, I wish they had just back into the closet. But the fact is, that's not the way it is. It's out in the open. It's there. And the Bible addresses it, and the Bible's very timely about that, even though many, uh, you know, thousands of years ago. But it is uh, still something that we see in our society today more than ever. And people want to deny it, and people want to act like it's no big deal. But we uh, are following God, and we love His Word, so therefore we hate the evil way. We hate wickedness. Now, are we wicked? Do we do some bad things? Of course. Nobody's saying that we don't. But we love God's Word, and we love righteousness, and we love good things. We want to despise and reject and have disdain for bad things. And homosexuality is a bad thing. So we should have a, an objection to it. We should be anti-homosexuality. Okay? Uh, I kind of wish that it didn't exist, but, uh, but here's the thing. The re one of the reasons it is so out in the open right now and accepted in our society is because preachers stopped preaching against it. It stopped being a thing to preach against, and it started being something that is kind of like a... You know, well, we just don't want to ruffle feathers. We don't want to look hateful. We don't want to, uh, you know, either we don't want to get a bad reputation in society and all that kind of stuff. But look, if preachers, if Baptist preachers, Bible-believing preachers don't preach out against something like homosexuality, in today's day and age, who's going to do it? Nobody's going to do it, right? Here's a, here's a shame, but uh, I don't. I don't, I don't recommend listening to Joe, Re Joe Reagan. Is that his name? Uh, he's kind of like into the UFC thing. Okay, you don't know, so good. Don't go looking, looking him up. Uh, he's got a bad mouth as far as I'm concerned. But, uh, but uh, Rogan, or Ray, I, can't, I can't remember. And, uh, and anyway, I listened to a clip of something he said because he was dealing with the, the issue of uh, biological men who were getting into sports, even in the, the UFC, Ultimate Fighting, which is mixed martial arts, okay? And they were biological men, but they were going and they were competing against ladies because they identified as a woman. And this is the Olympics, permeates the Olympics right now. You're seeing all these world records being set in the women's category, but they're being set biological men who claim to be women. It's so ridiculous, okay? It's, a, it's really strange that, that we've gotten to this point in our, in our country. And so here's this guy. Not a Christian that I know of. I don't think he is. He doesn't act and sound and, and talk like he's a Christian anyway. He's definitely somebody that the world goes to for entertainment and to look at, you know, different uh, commentaries on sports or UFC, whatever. But here's a guy who's getting all kind of flack. All these people are threatening to, like, ban his show from their service uh, and, and, and talk about him like he's just this homophobe and he's, he's, so, uh, he's got all these problems and he's... Um, so rude and all this kind of stuff. And he's just like, I'm just telling the truth. 
this is stupid, and you guys are lying to yourself, acting like this isn't stupid. And he goes explaining the details about it and how absurd it is that these people can uh, train with the, man, with the man's bone density the way that it is and the testosterone that allows, it, uh, allows them to get to a certain uh, ability, a physical performance. And then at the last minute, they take some estrogen, which science has shown that estrogen actually locks in their bone dis- density. Uh, it just like locks it in, right? But then it reads as though they have a lower testosterone. So they're like, okay, now you can compete against the women. Absurd. Ridiculous. And so now this man and this woman fight each other, but he's calling himself a girl, but he's fighting this and cracks her skull open. It, it, to where she's like bleeding out and she's like, oh, well, I can't say anything. You know, I, I, it's absurd. And so here's a guy who's not even a preacher. He's not even religious, maybe Christian. I don't, I mean, he might claim to be a Christian. I don't know, but he's not religious. And he's speaking out about this situation. And when a Baptist preacher speaks out about it, everybody's like, oh, now you don't want to be like that now. You don't want to get a bad, you got to love everybody and, and you got to accept everybody. Look, somebody's got to call it what it is. And if Baptist preachers can't do it, who's going to do it? But I want to talk about a uh, little bit of a different perspective. Uh, well, we got to read the verse, okay? God isn't, an, uh, God isn't a homophobe. You think he's afraid of homos? No. He's not a homophobe. But he is anti-homosexuality. He is an anti-homo. Look at uh, Leviticus 2013, like you didn't know I was going to go there. Leviticus 20. And this is this is actually this these verses that I'm going to read to you. Three verses everybody in here is probably familiar with them. Here's why we have to know these verses are there. And here's why we need to preach these verses. Because Christians today act like these verses aren't even in the Bible. Christians today are like, well, that's your interpretation, and that's what you think. But the Bible actually doesn't say, I, I had a guy actually send me, uh, a guy that went, I went to Bible college with, and since he's kind of gone more liberal, and he actually sent me like three books. And these three books were basically like, Uh, talking about how to minister to homosexuals and it was like going into the science behind it and all that kind of stuff. And it was ridiculous. Okay. Uh, It was just everybody just trying to stretch and make it like, Hey, the Bible, when it says that, that word doesn't really mean this. And it's just like this pages and pages of just jumping through hoops to say, it's not as bad as you say that it is. Well, we need to read these verses as 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 clearly as can be and see what the Bible says. Leviticus 20, verse 13. If a man also lie with mankind as with as he lieth with a woman, both of them have committed an abomination. Shall be on them. Now you get up and you say, Leviticus 20, 13, and you read that word for word. You know what they're going to say? Well, yeah, I know it's bad, but... Doesn't the Bible have the death penalty on other things too? Let's forget about that for a second. <laughs> the wickedness is of this sin. God's judgment and how he feels upon this sin is that he believed it should be put to death. Like, don't Their blood's on them. Don't even feel bad about it. Let it be put to death because what they're doing is so wicked. And if you look at the Canaanites uh, as they went to that land and dealt with their wickedness, God, they, these guys had, uh, I just preached on this recently, but they had come from Ham's line that God had cursed. And he, and basically these people were rejected of God uh, because they were going to live so wickedly and they were going to reject God. God doesn't just reject people because he feels like it, okay? He rejects them whenever they reject him and go after all manner of wickedness as opposed to God. And he says, hey, I just turn them over. I harden their heart. I mess up with their mess up their mind, and then they can't even uh, they can't even seek me. Okay, and so they went into all manner of wickedness, and it's really interesting that you see what happened in Leviticus, uh, all these things in Leviticus 18, and here in Leviticus 20, and all these things that they did. All this was as the result of people who had just been given over to a reprobate mind and did all manners of evil. And he says, "Look, you need to get that out of the land." He says, "The land's going to vomit them up." 
You know, it doesn't want them in the land. You need to get rid of their, them, and their blood's on them. Okay, and so they went into the land, and that's what they did. Today, a lot of people read that, and they're just like, oh, that's just... No, the people that want to be, they want to reject God, maybe they want to be atheists or something like that, they'll say, oh, look, what a wicked God that would go in there and do that, okay? We understand that someone that rejects God is going to do that. But then you get Christians today that are just like, oh, well, that was the God of the Old Testament. The God of the New Testament wouldn't do that. <laughs> but God doesn't change. This is how he felt about it. And he said, this wickedness is an abomination. I don't want to look at it. I don't want to have it in the land. And so they went into the land and they got rid of it. But guess what they did? Some of them kind of adapted into the lifestyle and got comfortable with the lifestyle and started serving their gods and doing some of the wicked things that they do. And God had to deal with them. This is what Leviticus 20, 13 is all about. Look at Romans uh, 1. Same, it's talking about the same concept here. Those who hardened their hearts, rejected God, and went after instead all manners of evil. They rejected the wisdom of God, so therefore they love wickedness. This is what I read about Proverbs 8. Uh, Romans chapter 1, New Testament, by the way. Verse 26. For this cause God gave them up unto vile affections, for even their women did change the natural use into that which is against nature. And likewise also the men, leaving the natural use of the woman, burned in their lust one toward another, men with men, working that which is unseemly, and receiving in themselves the recompense of the error which was meet. So the idea there is that, hey, that's what they get. That's what God is going to give to them for, uh, for their wickedness. Jude, verse 7. Jude, verse 7. Making reference to the events in Sodom and Gomorrah, which I'll read here in a little bit. He refers back to that in Jude, verse 7. He says, Even as Sodom and Gomorrah and the cities around them in like manner, giving themselves over to fornication... Okay, if he just stopped at that, you'd be like, oh, you know, fornication. We don't know exactly what they did. But then he says, and going after strange flesh, if you go back to Genesis 19, you know exactly what's going on. The men around the city are there around the city and they see two men. We know they're angels, but they thought of them as men. And uh, they saw two men going in there and they sought after that strange flesh. And here's what it says. Uh, they are set forth as an example who? Sodom and Gomorrah. What happened to Sodom and Gomorrah? Destroyed by fire. It says, they are set forth as an example, suffering the vengeance of eternal fire. I think the Bible is really clear about how God feels about uh, the sin of homosexuality. So yeah, but what about these other sins? I've preached on those. I'm preaching on homosexuality right now. <laughs> Actually, I'm not. I'm preaching on homophobia. All right, so let's get with the point of the message. Okay, I want to talk about this. Here's three points I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to preach on. Who the real homophobes are today? Who is a real homophobe? Okay, number one. You could say a homo, someone who's homophobic is somebody who has an irrational fear of being called a homo. All right, irrational fear of being called a homo. You might be surprised to know this, but the first time the word homophobe or homophobia was used, this is what they meant. Okay, uh, this was actually the original use of the word. Homophobia was first used in public. It was first printed in the public uh, uh, publication in 1969, and it was published in. Uh, excuse me for even talking about this. I don't even want to talk about it, but it was published in a porn magazine that was called Screw, and it's talking to men, and it uses the word, uh, which, by the way. I don't know if it's a thing anymore, but I remember when I was younger, when I was a teenager, it was like socially acceptable to read those kinds of things, but they were just reading them for the articles or looking at the pictures. They're just reading for the articles. And I remember going to a barber shop and there were pornography like magazines. Now they, people don't really do magazines. Now they go online or whatever, but there was magazines sitting there. And this was like, this is where the gentlemen were, you know, quote unquote. And they had these things, it's garbage, it's filth. And even if you took all the pictures out and just read the text, 
It's garbage that people fill their mind with. Dumb. Don't, don't read. There's no reason to read that kind of stuff. Okay? But here in this kind of material, this guy used the word uh, homopho homophobia, and here's what he was talking about in the article. He was talking about those people who are afraid to do certain things because people might think uh, that they are homo. So, look, we have this today. Like, I won't wear a pink shirt because I don't want somebody to be like, oh, he's a sissy. Look at him. He's a feminine. Oh, look at him. He's a homo. So they won't wear pink. Uh, the article talked about guys who are afraid of poetry and art and stuff like that because they don't want to be sissified. And so it said that they were homophobic. And what it was that they were afraid of homosexuals. It was afraid that people would identify them and call them homo. <laughs> and so they were homophobes, is, what, is the implication of what that word was. And I definitely think that that exists today. I definitely think there are people out there that are like fake manly. You know what I mean? Like they're, they, they want to come across as being these hard men that just do. And look, I think it's great to have a man be a man and uh, just be manly and get dirty. All the things, that, stereotypical things that you think about guys doing. But there are some people who do that, I believe, to a fault because they have this irrational phobia that if they do anything, uh, you know, that, uh, that the, somebody else might think that they're, uh, that they're a homo. Then, the, then they won't do it. And I remember in the, in the 80s, there was this thing, don't get me wrong, I still don't wear a pink shirt, okay? But I remember in the, in the 80s, uh, it was a popular thing. People were wearing pink. And then somebody would make fun of them, hey, you're wearing a pink shirt. And they would say, I'm secure in my manhood. Have you ever heard that? <laughs> okay. I'm secure in my manhood. What they're saying is, I'm not a homophobe. I'm not worried that you're going to call me that. I'll wear whatever I want to wear, right? Now, there's something to be said about that. Now, don't get me wrong. I think that we should avoid the appearance of, uh, men should avoid the appearance of being effeminate, okay? Women should avoid the appearance of looking masculine. I've preached on that. Uh, you know, Deuteronomy 22, 5, we preached on that. It says, a woman shall not wear that which pertaineth unto a man. Neither shall a man put on a woman's garment. For all that do so are abomination unto the Lord thy God. So not only does he hate homosexuality, he hates a man even looking like a homosexual or a woman even looking like that. And, uh, and, or, or in the, what we'd call it today is a transvestite, but it's all kind of f from the same point. It's like God made you to be this, and you're trying to pretend like you're something else, and you're going after strange flesh, and you're doing all that. That's not right. 1 Corinthians 6, verse 9. Don't misunderstand what I'm saying. To be effeminate or to look like... Uh, kind of like ladylike if you're a guy and look like a sissy is wrong. It's wrong. In fact, I would say it's a sin. 1 Corinthians 6, 9 and verse 10. I'm sorry, uh, verse 9 and 10 says, uh, Know ye not that the unrighteous shall not inherit the kingdom of God. Be not deceived, neither fornicators, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor effeminate, nor abusers of themselves with mankind, nor thieves, nor covetous, nor, nor extortioners shall inherit the kingdom of God. What's he given? He's giving a list of things you're not going to see in heaven because these are wicked things that God doesn't want anything to do with, okay? So we know by this list these are things that God hates. And one of the things he hates is men that are effeminate. All right, now it's really interesting. I'm not big on going back to the Greek. In fact, I just defended this afternoon. Somebody was talking about going back to the Greek, and I said, hey, you know, I just think the King James Bible should speak for itself. But I'm going to break my rule here for a second. If you go back into the Greek and look up places where that word, the original word from where the King James translated effeminate, you're not going to find a lot of places. But another word that is used is, guess what, soft raiment. I just preached on that recently whenever we were going through, uh, Jesus was talking about John the Baptist. He says, what did you expect? You know, a man in soft raiment, <laughs> okay? And that's the same word, actually, that's used. And so this idea of effeminate or being soft or being non-masculine whenever you're a man, it's wrong, okay? But I think that our society uh, does go too far sometimes. I remember raising my boys feeling like, am I doing wrong by not making? learn how to play football and basketball and, and, and compete against these guys at camp and all this kind of stuff. I have to weigh this out, and I'm like, hey, if my kids don't want to play uh, certain sports, am I wrong 
for not making them do that? What's a, it's just a dumb sport, right? I remember, uh, you know, certain things, uh, uh, Zachary, uh, I hate to pick on Zachary. He's not here to defend himself or anything like that, but I remember Zachary. Uh, I kid you not, uh, somebody bought him a knife. He's a little bitty kid, all right? And somebody bought him a knife for Christmas. And, uh, and he was like, oh, cool. And he's like, hey, I could go out in the, go- in, in the backyard and I can cut flowers for mommy with this. Everybody just stopped like, what? Some people would be like, oh, no, he's a feminine. You know, get rid of, no, you got to use this knife for like killing squirrels and, and, <laughs> you know, gutting them and, and, and skinning them. And you got to act like you're going to stab people and you got to do all this. And, and, and you know what? I thought that was sweet. He wanted to cut flowers for his mom. <laughs> he liked those kinds of things. Some people are, oh no, see, you're raising a sissy and you got to, you got to make them do this and you got to make them do that. That means... What I think whenever people are like that is they're a homophobe. They're afraid that people are going to label them something because they don't fit a certain mold or do a certain thing. I think that's wrong. I don't think you should be a homophobe by that definition. Men today, here's what I think they need to do. If they're raising kids, they need to weigh out, am I doing this because I truly want to teach my boy how to be a man, or am I teaching that because I'm afraid he's not going to fit a mold and people might call him names or something like that? Okay, Uh, that is a type of homophobia that men struggle with today. And I don't and and that I agree with that it's homophobia and that that it's not right. Now, men, again, you got to weigh it out. It's the man's responsibility. You're teaching your son. You want to teach him how to be a man. You want to teach him uh, to to act like a man, behave like a man, dress like a man, all that stuff. I understand. But don't let it be based on the homophobia. Okay. Uh, the second thing that you could call a homophobe, homophobic person is those who have an irrational fear of being around a homo. Now, look, I said irrational, okay? Again, if I don't like spiders because they're creepy and they're gross or they might be poisonous, I just don't know, and I don't want to or a snake or whatever, that doesn't mean I have arachnophobia. That's not a phobia, okay? There's a certain uh, time that it's justified to say, hey, I don't want to be around this. I don't want to be a part of this. I don't want to see their wickedness. That's not irrational. That's not a phobia, okay? If you say, I don't trust somebody who is a homosexual, that's not, there's, there's nothing wrong with that. If I'm, as a pastor, say, hey, I'm not going to accept somebody in the church who has an open, you know, uh, testimony of being a homosexual, that doesn't make me a homophobe, (laughs) right? Oh, no, I'm scared. Well, he's got cooties or something like that. No, I mean, that might be a (laughs) reason. (laughs) But I'm saying, I'm saying that's different than what I'm talking about. But what I'm talking about is there might be somebody uh, who, who has an unrational fear about that. Uh, uh, Psalm 101.3 says this, I will set no wicked thing before mine eyes. I hate the work of them that turn aside. It shall not cleave to me. And so, you know, to the point where you're like, hey, I don't want to look at that. I don't want that in my city. Uh, when we moved to Iola, of all places, Iola, little podunk town, right? 4,000 people. You would think, oh, at least you're safe from all that stuff. You're not in the big city. And right across from the church was this guy who would walk his dog with high heels and a miniskirt. And my kids, when we first went there, little bitty kids, and I'm just, I don't even want them to know that that exists. And I want to like hide their eyes and say, hey, don't go outside right now. There's a weirdo out there. Now people be like, hey, you're a homophobe. No, that's not homophobia. That's just saying, I don't want my eyes to be defiled. I don't even want to look at that wickedness, okay? It's not homophobia. Now, I do believe that you could go too far and you could have a uh, irrational fear. And here's what I mean by that. Like, you, you just come in contact with somebody and they look like, they look kind of queer. You know, they look different. They look, maybe it's a woman, but she looks kind of butch or whatever, and you just have this irrational fear like, oh, that person's a reprobate. I'm not even going to talk to them. That's homophobia. <laughs> okay, that is a, that's closer to what the world is talking about when they say homophobia. But, but it's still not, uh, like I said, um, obviously uh, you're not afraid of a person because they're, they're that. But there are those who are just have this irrational fear. Uh, the first time I met Pastor Anderson, now 
if, if one person has got a, a, a testimony of being a preacher who preaches hard against homosexuality as Pastor Anderson. First time I ever met him, we actually went on a hike. And uh, we went through, uh, what's it called? I think it was called Camelback Mountain or something like that. I was, I was in Arizona for a wedding. He and I had been talking on the phone about ultra marathons and stuff. And, and so I didn't really know him super well, but I, I was like, hey, yeah, let's get together and go for a hike. And we went, and the, the little bit I knew about him was, you know, he doesn't like men peeing, peeing uh, sitting down. And because that's what everybody wanted to share that video, right? And he hates homos, right? Those are the two things about him. So when we were going on the hike in Arizona, and think about the culture, you know, that usually is into like the hiking and the nature trails and stuff like that. Sometimes you got some some very liberal minded people that are involved in that. And we got on, on the trail, and I remember uh, as we got towards the end, there was this lady. She was somehow in charge of. Uh, I don't know, keeping track of people or something. I don't know what her job was. And she looked the part. She looked like, I mean, in fact, I, I, I just, I wouldn't have wanted to ask because it's <laughs> just like, I got a feeling that this lady is a, uh, is a uh, queer, right? Homo. And I remember thinking, what's he going to do? <laughs> you know, is he going to start, you know, all those rants I've seen and uh, on the videos where he's jumping up on the pulpit and he's busting holes in the, what's he about fixing to do? Because I think he's about ready to come in contact with a lesbian. Uh, and he gets over to her and I'm just like, this is going to be good. <laughs> and he has like the most friendly conversation with her. I'm saying her. I mean, I know she looked manly, but it was a her. We don't know anything about her story. We don't know how she got to where she is, why she chose to look like that. We don't know anything. We don't have any reason at that point to think, hey, I'm not talking to that person. She's a reprobate. And I remember my respect for him went up and I said, hey, all these people that act like he just hates anybody who looks this way or looks that way or labels everybody a reprobate. He gave this lady the benefit of the doubt. They had a great conversation. He was very, uh, he didn't ever get to it, but I thought he's fixing to give her the gospel, <laughs> right? And, I, and since then, I've had to reason in my own mind Many times, like, how far do you go on giving somebody the gospel? Well, here's the thing. The Bible says preach the gospel to every creature. Amen. Preach the gospel to every creature. You say, well, I don't know. That person might be. Yeah, they might be. I don't know their backstory. I don't know who they are. I'm not a homophobe in the sense that I'm not going to preach the gospel to somebody because they, it's a guy that looks kind of effeminate or, you know, whatever. Look, if someone's a reprobate, they're going to let you know. <laughs> they're going to let you know. They're going to come out mocking you and laughing at your God and, and saying all kinds of wickedness to you. And you just say, don't say have a good day. Just turn around and go to the next door, okay? And the, the reprobates are going to let you know. But somebody who's just, uh, who knows what their story is, you know? Uh, in, in Iola, uh, in our youth group, we had, we had girls that went to public school, had no father figure around, had no... Uh, 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 discipline or instruction in their life or whatever, they're just going with the trends. You know, maybe maybe they already kind of had some masculine features, weren't very attractive looking or something like that. And so next thing you know, they're cutting their hair short, they're dressing like boys, and they're like, hey, this is the fad, this is the cool thing to do. Look, I don't think they're a reprobate. I don't know how far they went into wickedness. And guess what? If they reject God, he's going to give them over to a reprobate mind, and they're going to go into that lifestyle, and they're going to be whatever, Okay. But I'm not going to like not reach out to that person and try to give them the gospel because they're starting to dress a certain way or whatever. You know, we want to catch them before they become reprobate. We just don't know when that is. God knew the heart. He could look on the heart. Look, God knew Judas was a reprobate, and he still even kept him around. Now, I'm not, <laughs> I'm not saying to uh, keep reprobates around, but here's all we can do is go off of wisdom. Again, if somebody's got a testimony of being a homosexual, and I'm like, I don't trust that. If you've done that, I don't know what kind of person you are. I don't know if you're deceiving me and you're really a reprobate. So I don't want you to be in our group and, and be influencing kids and be around kids and all that stuff. So you're not welcome. That doesn't make me a homophobe. That means I'm just using wisdom and I'm trying to protect my people because I don't know. Right. But the homophobe would be somebody who's like, Ooh, I don't even want to go around that. I don't even want to talk about that. And you know what? Here, here, here's, here's my view on that. Okay. If anybody says, hey, I'm not going to go knock on that door because they got a rainbow flag out there 
and I don't even want to have anything to do with that, I'm not going to make them knock on that door. <laughs> Any more than if one of my kids uh, said, you know, hey, I'm not comfortable talking. I have a fear of talking at the door, and so I don't want to do that. Hey, praise the Lord. Be a partner. Get involved. Do what you can, right? But I'm not going to make them, you know, force them to get over that, that phobia or whatever. Does that make sense, what I'm saying? I'm not going to make somebody, hey, no, 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 no. You've got to like the homos. <laughs> That's, that's, that's ridiculous. That's, that's, I mean, I would never, you know what I'm saying. You've got to like be around that culture. I've heard Baptist preachers kind of brag about the fact that they're super sensitive to, uh, to like a community of LGBT, whatever, super sensitive to that. And I'm just like, why in the world would you just pick a group of people and say, hey, I'm just going to go after and try to love and try to reach and try to be... How about this? You just knock on doors. You preach the gospel to whoever's at that door. You know, I like this phrase. I heard somebody say, you know, hey, I have accidentally preached the gospel probably to more homos than all those people that hate me, hating the homos, ever knocked on the door. You know what I mean? Because here's the thing that people are just like, oh, man, you got to be sensitive. You got to be loving. You got to be kind to the homos and all this kind of stuff. And you're like, well, how many have you tried to reach? Well, I've got this person in my family that I'm trying to win. I'm trying to build a relationship. I'm trying to reach them, right? And they've got one person. They've never even given them the gospel. They're just like trying to win their love and affection and all that. Well, that's that's weird. That's weird. Just go knock on doors. They're not going to get saved, <laughs> okay? And if they're not, you know, you gave them the gospel. Hopefully they, hopefully they uh, will listen to that and get saved. Preach the gospel to every creature. That's a one uh, another group of people who could be homosexual. But let me tell you about the third group of homophobes. A third group of homophobe. Those who have an irrational fear of what the homos will do to them if they speak against their sin. <laughs> now here's what's funny about that is the people, the preachers that are all like, Oh, no, don't be a homophobe. You don't want to be a homophobe now. You know what's going to happen. We're going to have a bad testimony in the community, and we're going to have it. You just proved that you're a homophobe because <laughs> you're afraid of what they're going to do to you if you preach against their sin. That's irrational. <laughs> Number one, it's such a small group of people in this world, and everybody acts like, oh, no, that's like 50% of our world is... is <laughs> It's like this other lifestyle or something like that. Like, it's not a lifestyle. It's not like you're just born that way, right? The Bible makes it very clear. It's a sin. And it's a decision that somebody has made for whatever reason. They've made this decision and they've gone after that wickedness. Like, I'm not afraid of the person. Uh, and I'm not afraid of what they're going to do to me. Like, I'm afraid if they came at me with a knife or a gun or a baseball bat, I'd be afraid just like I'm afraid of anybody else who would do that. But I'm not afraid that if I preach against this, you know, they're going to like ban us from YouTube or they're going to ban us from Facebook or they're going to. Look, I'm not afraid of them. Right. That's that's homophobia. I'm not a homophobe. Lot was a homophobe. Look at Genesis 19. Lot was a homophobe. Genesis 19, verse 4. But before they lay down, all right, you know the story. These two men were there. We, we understand that they were angels, but at that time, it's just two men. It's described as two men. Everybody in the city, there were two men. They were just strangers. <clears throat> but before they lay down, the men of the city, even the men of Sodom, compassed the house round, both old and young, all the people from every quarter. And they called unto Lot, and said unto him, Where are the men which came into thee this night? Bring them out unto us, that we may know them. And Lot went out at the door unto them, and shut the door after him, and said, I pray you, brethren, do not so wickedly. Behold, now I have two daughters which have not known man. Let them, I pray you, bring them out unto you, and do ye to them as is good in your eyes. By the way, when people do what is good in their own eyes, it's always wicked. Only unto these men do nothing, for therefore come they under the shadow of my roof. And they said, Stand back. And they said again, This one fellow came in to sojourn, and he will needs be a judge. Now will we deal worse with thee than with them? 
And they pressed sore unto the man, even Lot, and came near uh, the back uh, 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 to break the door. Now here's what this story shows us, is that these wicked people that were going after this strange flesh, and there's a lot I could preach about this story, but that's not my intent. These wicked people, there was no way to, to pacify them. There was no way to placate them. There was no, there was no giving them something that would satisfy them. They're going to do their wickedness no matter what. Okay, so he's locking the door and all this kind of stuff. Look, that's what we would all do. We'd go get our guns or whatever and try to protect our, ourselves right from that door. This man does, in my mind, what's the most wicked thing he could have done. You say, oh, no, no. And I, I've said this before. What this does show is how wicked he thought that sin was that they were wanting to do. The sin of sodomy. That's why it's called sodomy. What they wanted to do was so wicked in his mind that he was like, you know what? I think it's better to give him my daughter. Well, no, you stupid. <laughs> you don't give him your daughter. What in the world? Well, maybe, maybe it'll save my life. Maybe it'll, whatever his wickedness was, he thought he could placate them by giving to them and conceding to them. And, oh, we don't want them to hurt us. And it makes me think of all these preachers who used to preach hard against the sin of, uh, of sodomy and the sin of uh, uh, homosexuality. And then all of a sudden, people started coming after them and calling them bad names and leaving them messages and news stations wanting to interview them and stuff like that. And they're just like, no, 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 no. Let me, let me clarify. I made some mistakes back in my young uh, child preacher days and all this kind of stuff. You know, that person's a homophobe. He's the one that's a homophobe because he's afraid of what they're going to do to him. That's a homophobia. Judges 19, story just as wicked. Interesting, Genesis 19, Judges 19, we have two stories of, uh, of what this, these type of wicked people can uh, produce, the actions that they can generate. Judges chapter 19, look at verse 20. And again, in this story, there was a, a guy that came into town and, uh, and, and this old man, the master of the house, takes him in, and he's, and he's, he's hosting him and everything. And he says uh, uh, in verse 20, The old man said, Peace be with thee, whosoever uh, let all thy, I'm sorry, howsoever let all thy wants uh, lie upon me, only lodge not in the street. He knew his town. He knew the wickedness that was out there, and he was afraid for this, for this guest of his. And so he brought him into his house and gave provender unto the asses, and they washed their feet and did eat and drink. Now, as they were making their hearts merry, behold, the men of the city, certain sons of Belial. All right, that's wicked people. This is, every time you say sons of Belial, it's talking about just the, 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 the sons of the devil, reprobates, right? Or just totally over, and, uh, and this is what it's usually talking about. Sons of Belial. Beset the house round about, and beat at the door. Sounds just like, and spake to the master of the house, the old man, I'm sorry, the master of the house, the old man, saying, bring forth the man that came into thine house, that we may know him. And the man, the master of the house, went out unto them and said unto them, nay, my brethren, nay, I pray you, do not so wickedly, seeing that this man is come in mine house. Do not this folly. Behold, here is my daughter, a maiden, and his concubine. Now, I don't know if that guy is passed out drunk or what he was in the other, or if, if he didn't care or what, but this guy had a concubine, which is wrong in itself. That's another story, okay? person he took kind of to be a wife and to fill, fulfill the wifely duties, but wasn't a legitimate wife, okay? Uh, no, no, this is one of the wicked practices they had in the Bible. But he has this concubine that he brings into this house. And so this old man, the master of the house, says, Here, take my... Uh, uh, take my daughter and take his concubine and he just gives them out he locks the door and it says uh, uh, do with them what seemeth good unto you but unto this man do not such a vile thing but the men would not hearken to him so the man took the concubine and brought her forth unto them and they knew her and abused her all the night unto the morning and when the day began to spring they let her go such a I hate even reading it you see why I don't want to preach on this subject that often why many preachers don't want to preach on it that often, why it's left unpreached. 
And then the world just says, oh, it might not be that bad. Not everybody preaches against it. That's because we don't want to preach against it. <laughs> it's filthy. It's vile. I don't want to read that kind of story. But this is what happens. And these men, they were unplacable, and they're going after him. And so what you see is this old man is just like, oh, no, what am I going to do? Here, take my daughter. Here, take this man's concubine. Who would give away their own daughter? Well, I tell you who would give away their own kids. Homophobes. And I'm telling you that there are Baptist preachers who are homophobes who are sacrificing their children to this, oh, no, no, you got to love them. you got to accept them. We'll have them in our house. We'll have them in our church. We'll have them in that because they're homophobes. And they'd sacrifice their own children because they don't want to have a bad image. They don't want to, they're afraid of what they're going to do to them. Look, that's homophobia. That's the, probably the worst kind. Those who have sacrificed their own children, allow them to be brainwashed and taught that these things are normal and, uh, and act like it's not that big of a deal uh, 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 because, hey, you don't want to be called a bigot. You don't want to be called hateful or whatever, you know. And that's, that, is, that is just wicked. So three, type, three ways that I believe somebody could be a homophobe is they have an irrational fear of being called a homo. They have around a homo, or they have an irrational fear of what homos will do to them. And I would say this, don't be a homophobe. Be anti-homo. <laughs> okay, let's pray. Father, thank you. Thank you for your word. Thank you for the warnings that you give us in your word about wicked people that exist out here. And uh, we understand uh, that there are people who grow up with no education, no teaching. They grew up in the public schools. They grew up with Hollywood. They have all this liberal uh, mentality fed down their, their minds, and, and they begin to uh, get confused. And we know there are legitimately people in this world who have been abused or uh, brainwashed or whatever and are confused and have lined themselves up with the uh, wicked people in this world. I pray that you would help us to reach those people uh, before they uh, before it's too late, uh, and help educate those who, uh, particularly our own family, our own children, and educate them as to what the Bible says is right and what's wrong. And I pray that you'll help us to be strong in that, to be bold in that, not to be afraid to stand for God. In fact, help us to, as Proverbs eight said, to have uh, godly wisdom. Help us to have wisdom and to fear God. And the fear of the Lord is to hate evil. And help us to hate evil in the proper way and, uh, and not, not an irrational or an illogical fear uh, of, of evil, but a fact that we fear you more than we fear the people or the things of this world. And so we put you first, put your word first. We're going to follow it no matter what. I pray you bless us as we seek to do that. Keep us safe us from uh, making mistakes that would harm our testimony uh, or harm us from doing the work that you've called us to do, but help us be strong in the faith and strong in the, the word as you've given it to us to preach. And I pray that you would be glorified in all that we do. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen.